This morning, I'd like to talk to you mostly about three uh, topics. Some basic information about invasive species, and review who are several response organizations that are active on the West Coast and in Oregon, and give some example of trends with respect to invasive species. A species is invasive if it has three things. If it's been introduced by human action to a location, area, or region. So in other words, it's not native there. It's capable of establishing a breeding population in the new area without further interaction from humans. And it becomes a pest in the location. So it's a threat to agriculture or industry or biodiversity. In terms of numbers, the numbers of invasive species that are currently present in North America and the United States are daunting. Uh, an estimated 5,000 non-native plant, non plant species have been introduced and established and exist within U.S. ecosystem. More than 250 non-native aquatic species from other continents and over 450 non-native aquatics that have been moved from their native area to other sites in North America. In terms of forest pests, there are more than 450 known forest insect and pathogen species established in the United States. If you break it down over time, there were approximately two and a half non-native forest insects detected in the U.S. each year between 1860 and 2006, and this number is expected to increase. What are species doing in the forest? Well, they're out-competing native species. They threaten human safety. They change and degrade the experience of outdoor recreationists. They require intensified maintenance and monitoring. They alter natural ecological processes. They reduce a forest's ability to sequester carbon. They change living trees that are acquiring carbon into dying trees that are releasing carbon. And they also have the potential to eliminate cultural resources. So who's trying to stop or manage invasive species in the Northwest? The first line of defense against inv new invaders is probably customs and border protection. They are um, responsible for detecting and intercepting invasive species as well as possible agents of uh, biological terrorism. So they do the inspections of goods and, and products that are coming into the ports. The United States Department of Agriculture's APHIS, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, is also probably the other most active federal agency in preventing invasive species. They protect uh, agriculture and natural resources. They regulate genetically engineered crops. They administer the Animal Welfare Act and help people and wildlife coexist. But they also certify the health of U.S. agricultural exports and resolve phytosanitary and sanitary issues to open, expand, and maintain markets for U.S. plant and animals. The U.S. Forest Service that I work for has three branches that are all involved in invasive species in some degree. Uh, you're probably quite familiar with the National Forest System, 193 million acres of forest land and waterways from Alaska to the Caribbean. And as a landowner and land manager, the Forest Service is involved in detecting and managing invasive species on those lands. The U.S. Forest Service also has a research branch that's involved with investigating the movement, impacts, and management options for invasive species. The, the branch of the Forest Service that I work for, state, private, and tribal forestry, provides resources to partners for invasive species surveys and treatments. There are many other federal agencies that deal with invasive species, either as a regulator, a manager, or a land manager. Among them, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Bureau of Land Management, Department of Defense, Bureau of Indian Affairs, all working to prevent, eradicate, and control invasive species 
using environmental approaches. And I, of course, that's not a comprehensive list. This morning I was thinking, oh, nuts, I forgot the National Park Service. I forgot this one, I forgot that one. It seems like everybody's involved in invasive species in some way. Oregon has many state agencies that are also involved in invasive species. The Department of Agriculture, again, is probably the leader because they're involved with monitoring, preventing, eradicating, and providing biological control of pest insects. They protect nursery and Christmas tree industries. They assist land managers and the weed board for noxious weed management. And they ensure that nursery products, livestock forage, and gravel are pest free. The Oregon Department of Forestry conducts surveys and provides guidance to state and private forest landowners. The Department of Fish and Wildlife detects and controls invasive fish and wildlife to benefit conservation and recreation. The Department of Environmental Quality regulates and monitors ballast water. Oregon State University and Sea Grant provide science-based educational programming. Parks and Recreation manages over 360 properties that are likely to be initial points of pest introduction. And with all these agencies sharing and having parallel missions, uh, the Oregon Invasive Species Council is incredibly important in providing coordination and communication between the federal and the state organizations. The trends in terms of invasive species are, are quite daunting. We expect to see more invasive species over time, and there are a number of causes for this. First of all, uh, global travel and trade. Uh, international visitors, both coming to the United States as well as Americans returning from international travel, has pretty much returned to pre-pandemic levels and many invasive species can come with travel. The amount of international trade has also been increasing over past years and with new trading partners and patterns. Uh, the map indicates if a product comes into the port of Seattle, in the blue area, it can be transferred to areas within the blue within three days, within the orange within four to five days, and within the white within six to seven days. This is almost instant opportunity for transmission of any invasive species that might be carried along with that. I'll tell you a few stories about um, global trade and, and anecdotes related to um, new pathways for invasive species. We've been, the departments of agriculture and APHIS have been successful at uh, eradicating and preventing the, the spongy moth, previously known as gypsy moth, from invading the western United States for about 40 years. And most of that attention has historically been focused on uh, outdoor household articles and vehicles that are coming west from the eastern United States and Canada that are infested with this, with this spongy moth. But in the early 1990s, as the Soviet Union was breaking down, there were new pathways formed because the, they had a variety of the spongy moth, now called the, um, the flighted spongy moth complex. So there's four or five different Asian spongy moth that can, the females can fly. Well, at the end of the 1990s, the, uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union, the several new Russian ports were opened along the Siberian coastline, and most of them had previously been uh, military ports, so they were they didn't have large city infrastructure around them. They had forests that came down pretty much to the shorelines, and there was a big outbreak of spongy moth occurring in that area, and the ships that came to trade through those ports became covered with spongy moth egg masses. And that was recognized and, some, and most of those ships were stopped and the spongy moth egg masses were cleared as much as they could during out at sea. But those were the first, uh, there were some that made it to shore in Oregon and Washington. 
and those were the first Asian bunching lung detections. And it, it was because there was a new pathway that it opened. Since then, there's been increasing attention on the ports because of some of the, the spongy moths in particular, as well as the recognition of the global trade and all the things that can be carried. Another example of a new pathway is kind of this fad or um, called the Marimol moss ball, which is a, a ball of algae. These balls occur naturally in Japan, Estonia, Ukraine, and parts of Eastern Europe. And these parts of Eastern Europe actually uh, concur with the, co-occur with the places that zebra and quagga mussels are native. So about a year and a half ago, a person in the pet store trade recognized that these uh, imported marimal moss balls had tiny little, uh, little zebra mussels it, adhering to them. And so with that recognition, oh no, we've been trying to prevent zebra and quagga mussels from getting here by regulating and managing and, and surveying boats and watercraft that were coming to the West Coast from infested parts of North America. And all of a sudden there's this new pathway that could bring zebra mussels on these, um, these pet store and aquarium items. This is a list, Ingrid, uh, Yolanda and Guanzo of APHIS recently did a study of, in a, um, a database of permit violations that's kept by APHIS of which products were uh, associated with violations that carried bark and wood boring beetles into the United States. And on this list, there's really only three of them that are actually wood products. There's some art wooden uh, handicrafts, wood stove parts from China, knotty altar doors from China, but the rest of all these items a lot of um, stone products, granite, marble, that were all coming from um, China, from Europe, from Turkey, and even like batteries and footwear with wood, some sort of wooden packing material that was infested. So there's incredible urgency to keep uh, close attention, not just on the wood products that are coming in, but all this packing material that tends to be low value, low quality wood, and sometimes that wood's infested with dangerous pests that can get here. Another reason that numbers of invasive species are, are rising is uh, global, uh, is climate change. And increased disturbances such as drought and wildfire create opportunities for invaders. In this picture, the, after the fire is passed, there's kind of a void here that's open for whoever's the, the quickest pioneer, the quickest plant that's able to take opportunity there. But this forest, with so many dead trees that are related to continuing drought, also is at risk, even though it doesn't appear that there's a vacuum there as those trees begin to lose their needles and sunlight hits the forest floor, there's an opportunity for plants to grow there as well. And a recent study from the, the US Forest Service Forest Inventory and Analysis examined about uh, 1,700 forest inventory plots, and of them, 61% contained an invasive species in what we pretty much thought could be intact forest. So they're there underneath those trees ready to um, emerge as, the, as those trees' needles drop. Climate change also creates the opportunity for range shifts. Now, an example of this is a special, a specific bark beetle called the California Five Spine Ips. Until 2010, its range was thought to be um, Here's California, the uh, Western California, the, and Western Oregon along the Willamette Valley. It, its host is pine species. 
In 2010, it was observed that there were giant trees along the Columbia Gorge. And that's not much of a range expansion to just cross a river. But um, by 2018, with some additional trapping, the insect had been found all the way as far north as Puget Sound and Moses Lake. Last summer, 2022, there were dead trees examined in uh, Bothell, Renton, and Fort Lewis that also had the California five spine dips present in, in actual dying trees, not just traps. And so there may be a need with climate change. These stress trees have, oh, and from continuing drought have enabled this tree, to, this insect to expand northward. It probably means that we need to take on new management strategies for pine similar to what we've been doing for some time in Eastern Oregon. In the last couple of years during the pandemic, so it didn't get a lot of press, the Oregon Invasive Species Council published this book called Invasive Species, Threats and Opportunities, a Primer for Oregon Policymakers. It's recently been returned to the Oregon Invasive Species Council's website. It had to get updated to say that uh, we'd already found uh, emerald, we, instead of preparing for emerald ash borer, that emerald ash borer had arrived. But this is an illustration from that, um, that primer that describes pathways. And I'd like to kind of read like a roll call what these pathways are. And you can probably think of more, but forestry and harvesting practices, livestock or contaminated feed, food and medicinals, firewood and wood products, passive spread through wind or water, movement of water, camping, hunting, and off-trail outdoor activities, spread by wildlife, hiking, biking, and other trail uses, travel and tourism, recreational vehicles, recreational watercraft, live bait, maritime transport, cars, trucks, trailers, and highway vehicles, nurseries, non-native and plant releases, rail transport, household movement, air transport, aquaculture. As you, can, as you think about these pathways, think about how they're uh, inconsistent, how they increase over time, and we often come to the conclusion that it's not if, but when a specific pest will get here or just more pests are coming. Um, we say that frequently when we were considering the emerald ash borer because it so quickly spread throughout the eastern United States. It so easily jumped to Colorado, and now it has, in fact, come to Oregon. This picture on the right is a subalpine fir tree at one time, about 12 years ago, it was practice, common practice to go to the Oregon forests and dig subalpine fir and sell them in the nursery trade. A bunch of these trees, dozens of these trees, were taken to Juneau, Alaska and planted. And just in the last couple of years, it's been recognized that they're infested with the balsam woolly adelgid, which is a serious invasive pest of trees in the genus Abies. So most of, many of those trees have had to be removed, but some persist, and they're really quite fortunate that there aren't native Abies trees in close proximity to Juneau. But they're not far, maybe 60 miles from Juneau is where you get native Abies that would be vulnerable to this pest. Um, moving firewood is just a conundrum. It's a, a terrible part of our culture that to the, um, prestige that comes from, and joy that comes from gleaning firewood from dying or dead trees and carrying it all around. This orange hawkweed picture, uh, I was looking for a picture of orange hawkweed because at one time my mother um, collected seeds. She saw these beautiful orange flowers and collected seeds and planted them in her garden and later came to realize that was orange hawkweed. But as I was just Googling for a picture of orange hawkweed, I, um, I found this ad that seeds $5 on Etsy, free shipping. 
I know some of the Department of Agriculture's have, have started monitoring the internet to try and find some of these pathways and stop people from um, potentially using them. This is the last slide that I have. And it, as I, pr I prepared these remarks of, and sent, submitted my presentation to the support staff a couple of uh, weeks ago, and we just determined that Mediterranean oak borer was present in Oregon white oak tree, one Oregon white oak tree in Oregon. So it was kind of a glum great grave time. And I thought, well, you know, stay informed, be deliberate. This situation's grave. We already have a bazillion invasive species. It's just getting worse. And I thought, that's not really fair to you as an audience that's come to this very practical, very um, pragmatic conference for dealing with invasive species in trees. Because truly, there are many good stories in the invasive species work. You know, nobody expected the, the Washington Department of Agriculture entomologists who were dealing with the northern giant hornet, the murder hornet, to become heroes. But they are. And the work that you do and the awareness you have makes you heroes. We've kept spongy moth out of the West Coast for more than 40 years. The, um, so there, the departments of agriculture are engaged in very challenging efforts to eradicate Japanese beetle in both Oregon and Washington. And um, the sudden oak death detected 22 years ago in Curry County, the southwest corner of Oregon, that it's there have been about 8,000 acres of treatments at the cost of about $36 million, and that was worth it to protect the forest, to protect the ability to provide time to collect tan oak acorns, and prevent, protect industry. Keeping the sudden oak death out of Coos County has protected the port of Coos Bay and enabled it to continue to um, try and improve its capacity. So I don't want to end with a glum grave, be deliberate, think about this, it's a terrible situation. Because the knowledge that you carry away from this conference is going to enable you to help be one of those, um, one of those contributors that will help prevent, slow the spread and prevent the addition of more invasive species. So thank you for being here. Thank you.